The Sonata No. 49 in E-flat by Joseph Haydn, played by Glenn Gould. Now, in conversation with producer James Kent, here is Glenn Gould. The attractive thing to me about Orlando Gibbons, which also attracts me to Haydn, is that one sees in him no particular response per occasion. He's an anti-physical man, in a sense. There's nothing of the Beethovenian virtuoso spirit. There's nothing of the I will now entertain you with my seventh, and my seventh will do what my sixth did not do. There's something eminently transferable about all his works. One could sense in any one of the pieces that uh, I want to play on this program um, a vocal strain. They are essentially polyphonic compositions in, in the vocal, as opposed to the keyboard polyphonic manner. And yet uh, he was something of a revolutionary in his anthems, he began to develop the verse anthem mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, to uh, write separate parts for right. instruments, whether it was for organ or strings. And this yes. was uh, really quite a new departure, which uh, led up to Purcell, Blow, and uh, mm -hmm. Pelham Humphrey. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, indeed the most attractive thing about him. He stood between two worlds. You know, he was a fan de siècle man in one respect. He uh, dovetailed the old polyphonic milieu with the new harmony-oriented world of the 17th century, and um, had the best of both of them, it seems to me. Um, he's an extraordinary man. And we have really that did... diminished uh, fifth in The Silver Swan, we have, uh, yes, uh, uh, which occurs right on death. Right, and I this know. is a, yeah. a very curious a uh, interval just to have in this uh, otherwise uh, yeah. smoothly flowing piece. It is no longer modal music, and yet uh, the pavan for the Earl of Salisbury, which I'm going to play, is um, incredibly modal in the sense that you get the most anguished cross-writing a G-sharp against a G-natural, hitting off a, you know, a surely Schoenbergian dissonance, and yet doing it in modal terms.
He was an extraordinary man, and yet he doesn't have any of the sort of revolutionary precocity of someone like Monteverdi, who thought so in terms of the new world that he was ready to overthrow the past and to have done with it. I mean, Gibbons really did savor and appreciate the tradition from which he had come. Obviously, he was like Bach in that respect, I suppose. Uh, that's an easy comparison, but uh, he was in a way. Was he writing for demand? Would you say that uh, some of his uh, things are uh, sort of the Gabrock music of his day? Because I want to follow that up and ask you if you thought that they actually danced to his uh, galliards and pavans, or whether this uh, was really uh, the music way I to play be it, performed. They possibly. <laughs> the devil that slow. Not <laughs> Have you seen any of the teenagers lately? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very interesting point, actually, because if it is true, as some people seem to feel, that the Baroque revival of the last 20, 30 years is not just recording sponsored, but pop recording sponsored, that the, you know, hard on the beatness of solid rock and so on has a lot to do with the return to JSB and all that, then um, Orlando Gibbons may well be coming into his own because the, uh, the, the new pop music is very asymmetrical as he was. time when music for the keyboard was just coming into its own, perhaps arrived at, at a very mm -hmm. good time, and he was, mm -hmm. I think, a very good player. Yeah, well. and yet he doesn't seem to have been a sort of ostentatious virtuoso, as John Bull of a slightly later time certainly was, or even William Byrd. You know, Byrd makes all kinds of sacrifices on behalf of the instrument. He adopts quite a different manner than when writing for um, the voice and writing for a vocal combination of any sort. Gibbons does not, essentially. This Italian ground, perhaps, is a little bit um, conventional in that way. But the rest of the music is virtually timeless in terms of the approach. I mean, it is a super-instrumental approach. He really is beyond instrumental considerations, very consoling for that reason.
had a lot in, in common, perhaps, with Charles Ives, in that he had this common touch. He would use mm -hmm. uh, chorales and uh, popular so, tunes yeah. of the day yeah. and work these into a serious composition. But I think he was a much more serious composer than Ives, in that he created the hymn tunes himself in many cases, mm -hmm. didn't he? He wrote about mm -hmm. 17. Mm -hmm. And his, his taste in choosing this material, I think, was perhaps above... Ives, who's uh, bringing in the sheaves and uh, corrals of this sort, uh, are are more evangelistic in tone. That's true. No, there isn't anything very evangelistic about uh, Gibbons. He seems to be in a very aristocratic spirit somehow or other. Um, there's a sense of enormous refinement in this music. I, I love it. I, I can't think of anyone else who captures quite as vividly what was happening in music circa the change of the 16th into the 17th century. Um, I, I think he's um, the great man of that age, certainly in North Europe. Gebrauch's music, and that leads us to Hindemith. Yeah, he certainly wrote a lot of whatever that was. What was it, workmanlike music, or work music for workmanlike no, people? No. <laughs> Workaday or Work -a -day. utility music. Mm -hmm. And he tried the rest of his life, I think, to live it down somehow. Yeah, I suppose he did in a way, although I must admit that my first great experience of contemporary music was via Paul Hindemith, and particularly Matthias the painter. I was 15 at the time, complete reactionary. I hated all music after Wagner, and a good deal of Wagner. And uh, suddenly I heard Matthias the painter in a recording, I think with Hindemith conducting, and flipped completely. This suddenly was the recreation of a certain kind of Baroque temperament that appealed to me tremendously. And um, I, as a 15-year-old, came alive to contemporary music via that experience. Well, it was a great change for him, wasn't it, to, to take up a serious, a very serious subject like this, mm -hmm. because he had really had a field day before that, hadn't he, with his satirical and humorous pieces. Yes, In fact, he was true. thought of as a funny man. Yeah, he was a kind of, um, what, Brechtian theater figure, I suppose, in his earliest days. Well, one of the English critics, Tovey, uh, compared him with Haydn. Really? Mm-hmm. As as, whenever he discussed Tobey. Haydn or Hindemith, yes. Isn't that marvelous? He, he would break up. Just thinking of the humor of them, too. <laughs> That's fascinating. Well, he was, in, in the early years, very explosive, very dynamic. And then, of course, he played all this down. Well, he, he had this tremendous ambivalence between the, these the, good spirits and outbursts uh, of various kinds, like the uh, satire, the, the opera that he wrote in 1929, uh, Neues vom Tage, mm -hmm. which was just the reverse of most operas. The love duet became the hate duet. In, in which the couple threw uh, breakfast things at each other. 
And then uh, instead of the wedding march, there was the divorce ensemble. Mm -hmm. And the big scene uh, had the heroine in a, naked in a bathtub with her correspondent there, the uh, hotel manager, and the gesticulating uh, servants. So it's an incredible personality. Yeah, yeah. But did all this vanish, do you think, in the 1930s? Because then he seems to have settled into this neoclassic, serious, sonata, strike quartet period of his. I mean, did all of this humor just disappear? What happened to Paul Hindemith, really? You know what took the humor out of Hindemith? He moved to the United States. <laughs> he became a very serious man. That may well have been. One thing about Hindemith is that he has apparently uh, no following today. He's had no school. He's had no real disciple. Um, n unlike Schoenberg, whose influence was perhaps at least as great as his compositions, no one has really come along to say, I am a Hindemithian. I will follow this cause. I will take up this banner and receive this mantle. No one has wanted to. It's very sad in a way because um, he was a composer of massive influence in the 1920s and early 30s. Hindemith yes. and Bartok, I suppose, were almost counterweights to the Schoenberg Viennese tradition. Yes. And uh, nothing has come. It was, it was a dead end. It was a sort of glorious backwater. How do you account for that, Glenn? I suspect he um, you know, drew the wrong lot in history, in a sense. Um, and in a most heroic way, he decided to stick with his original choice, which was to supplant tonality by a kind of new tonality, which he would invent around the old tonal modulatory forms. Instead of accentuating the dominant, he would accentuate the subdominant. Instead of accentuating the mediant and the submediant, the supertonic and the leading tone harmonies. And, and do you think this a... would uh, condemn a composer? No, I, I think it's what makes a composer an inventor, and I think he was, in that sense, a great inventor and much to be admired. Um, but does does being an inventor make a person a great composer? No, and that's where I think Paul Hindemith went wrong.
The Sonata Number no. 3 by Paul Hindemith, the final work on this recital by Glenn Gould. Earlier in the program, Glenn played Haydn Sonata Number no. 49 in E-flat and Four Pieces by Orlando Gibbons, Italian Ground, Lord Salisbury Galliard, Lord Salisbury Pavan, and the Fantasia in C. The program, produced in Toronto by James Kent, was the final presentation on tonight's CBC Thursday Music which we sincerely hope you've enjoyed as much as we've enjoyed preparing it.